kind of terms people use. Uh, so there's spasticity, uh, and sometimes people talk about dystonia. You'll also hear words like rigidity, Parkinsonism, another word, dyskinesia, tremor, stereotypies, apraxia, ataxia. So these are all the terms that you might come across. And uh, some people use them quite loosely. Uh, others might be quite uh, a bit more specific. So, you know, you'll hear people talk about ataxia and uh, that's sometimes used as a, a, a general description of somebody who's got poor coordination. So somebody tends to fall over easily uh, or has uncoordinated hand movements. Um, whereas other people use it in a much more specific way to mean a, class, a, a particular type of uh, movement disorder, which uh, often are associated with abnormal eye movements, nystagmus, uh, as you call it. So ataxia actually is probably a component whenever you've got problems with controlling, you know, your, usually your midline uh, difficulties with controlling balance in sitting or um, walking with wide-based feet, for example. So ataxia is quite often there uh, present in anyone who is able to walk. And then this term apraxia, that's probably used less um, in paediatrics. They use it a lot in adult sector. You can get apraxia after you've had a stroke and it essentially means you've lost uh, or you've got difficulty in planning your movement. So you can't necessarily work out what to do if you've got a sequence of things to do. So uh, sometimes you find that where you're not entirely sure how to use cutlery, for example, in children who've still got some hand use or how to hold a cup um, you know, not sure how to orient your hand to get to the, um, uh, the handle, uh, for example, or turn the cup to the, the mouth when you're holding the beaker. So that's apraxia, but you also hear people talk about gait apraxia uh, as well, and that usually means that the stiff-legged walk uh, that uh, girls with uh, Rett syndrome can have. So they don't quite seem to know how to bend one joint at the same time as straightening another so trying to do that usual smooth walking uh, tends to be more with that stiff leg gait or bent over. Um, stereotypies um, are the term that's often used uh, to describe the hand movements they're somewhat purposeless but um, sometimes seem to have some uh, increase at certain times such as during anxiety uh, for example and stereotypies are were one of the original features identified in Rett syndrome. And you can see a type of stereotypies in uh, children with autism as well. So in autism, it tends to be uh, classically hand flapping uh, movements. Um, but uh, in Rett syndrome, it tends to be more the hands uh, tending to be together and close to the mouth, for example. Um, and then these are other terms um, which I've mentioned. Uh, tremor, I think that's fairly uh, widely used term, it, you know, it means what we think. Uh, in essence, um, uh, it tends to be high frequency, sort of uh, a rapid uh, type of movement, uh, often seen in the hands, uh, for example, but sometimes you can see it in the head uh, as well. Now the term dyskinesia and dystonia, they're often used interchangeably, they both begin with D. Uh, often people use dyskinesia just to mean, you know, it, the movement doesn't look right, it doesn't look very fluid. Uh, for example. Other people use it to mean that they've got excessive and involuntary movements. Uh, so it is a slightly loose term. Um, you can see dyskinetic movements, as say, in children with cerebral palsy uh, as well. Um, and uh, quite a lot of these features, such as spasticity, dystonia, were originally and mostly seen in cerebral palsy and then noted to be an issue in uh, girls with Rett syndrome, particularly as they got older, I think. I mean, particularly spasticity. I mean, we don't see spasticity so much in uh, Rett syndrome except at the older ages. So spasticity is usually, it's a type of muscle stiffness which is induced by moving a limb quickly. So if you move it slowly, uh, you don't get much resistance. Whereas if you move it quickly, uh, you get more resistance. And you often see that as a juddering in the ankles. Um, part of the problem is uh, you, you often don't see spasticity if you've got a lot of other uh, muscle contractures. So if you've got stiff joints, then you won't see the that reflexive increase in stiffness of the muscle because you can't move it uh, very quickly. Um, I've got some pictures of that just to uh, 
try and explain it. And dystonia means, you know, as they usually posturing, you know, so in that picture, middle picture with um, the, uh, uh, the girl, um, adolescent, it looks um, with the, uh, the wrist flexed, you know, that can be a, a type of uh, dystonic posturing. You'd have to feel the wrist uh, to see, is the wrist able to, are you able to move the wrist? Uh, if you can't move it, and that often means that you've got a contracture, you can't, it's actually some, a problem with the, the joint itself in the long term or shortening um, of the muscle tendon. Um, and then Parkinsonism and rigidity is uh, something that you tend to see more in adults, but it's a different type of uh, deficient movement, uh, sometimes responds to certain medications uh, that they use in Parkinson's uh, disease, such as Cocarol Dopa. So that's, a, that's just to try and explain some of these terms. Now, I might have some videos. Let me just um, stop sharing just for a second whilst I try and get these videos to work. Right, I've got... Right, now, can you see a video playing at the moment? I'll play it again, sorry, it just might go on a loop. Yeah, you can see that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that, that's, I'm sure you, you don't need any introduction uh, or explanation of that. So that's the classical uh, stereotypy uh, movements in somebody. So these are videos I got from YouTube, actually, just to, so they're all in the public domain and just, I found some examples of individuals um, who've got different movements. So that's the kind of classical stereotypy. Now, we wouldn't tend to think of that as dystonia. Um, and it can be a bit confusing sometimes what's dystonia. So dystonia usually means involuntary. And you generally get the impression that stereotypies, they just they generally put into the voluntary group. They may not have a, you know, an active function uh, as such, uh, and they may seem to appear to interfere with function, um, but uh, I think partly for historical reasons, it's not considered to be as involuntary as uh, dystonia. So you, you wouldn't typically treat these types of movements with dystonia medication. Uh, I don't think they work, and they'll usually just end up causing side effects. And I suppose the reason why and we try and distinguish these stereotypies from dystonias uh, or dyskinetic movements is um, to avoid over-medication as much as anything. Uh, let me just see if I can get another video. So, Can you see this video? Am I sharing at the moment? Yeah. Okay, so this is a someone else with more involved movements. And once again, you can you can't necessarily, I mean sometimes you have to feel what's going on uh, in the arms and legs to see how much is stiffness, but you generally get the impression that uh, she has some uh, stiffness. Uh, you get the impression that her mum, I assume, is trying to straighten the legs and has to put some effort in there to get the legs straightened. I mean, there's still some stereotypies or hand wringing movements there. And young girl seems to have some tooth grinding or chewing movements as well. That's often seen. So that's just to give a, an overall impression of uh, some more involved uh, movements and probably does have some stiffness underneath, but you'd have to lay your hands on to check whether that's the case. Uh, so she may be evolving some uh, rigidity or dystonia underneath uh, as well. And then another video I found. 
And so this is someone who appeared to have more movement. So I'll just try and I'll repeat some of these good moves quickly. So around here, she appears to have some problems with uh, opening out her hand on this side, on the left. So you can certainly see that with dystonia. So that may be involuntary. Uh, you'd want to see how they are in terms of, um, you know, if they're trying to, uh, if, if it seems to be getting in the way uh, usually or causing any symptoms. You get the impression here, let's have a look. So this is, I think, demonstrating some of the difficulties with walking. There's that kind of stiff legged gait uh, as well. And, at that point here, her hand appears to be looser and she's doing other things. So often with dystonia, it tends to increase at certain times, such as when you're excited or, you know, sometimes when you're looking intently at something, the dystonia can increase as well. And then I've just got some examples from that are not in children with Rett syndrome, just to give some examples of other conditions. So, so this is a girl who's got uh, ticks. Uh, she's got uh, Tourette's, so this is from a TV program just about Tourette's. So you can see she's got some ticks. So she had some facial ticks there. And so that, that's not uncommon, those types of movements, wringing of the neck and facial movements often increases with anxiety and once again it's not classically put into the spectrum of dystonia uh, but it can cause a lot of confusion even I can be uh, sometimes not always clear whether something's a tick or a dystonic involuntary movement sometimes uh, usually that ticks are voluntary and you can suppress them um, but they can be increased by anxiety again and appear to interfere with your actions so uh, often the, the, the drug treatments that you use for dystonia tend to make you a bit uh, sedated and don't tend to work that well on these ticks. So that's why you try and distinguish them. But it can be difficult sometimes. And then this is somebody who's got much more clear dystonia or dyskinetic movements. So, um, so he's got generalised dystonia. Uh, not, we don't know what the condition is, but you can see something similar in children with cerebral palsy after birth injury. So it's not necessarily a genetic uh, condition. So, you know, he's trying to, the boy's trying to undertake a lot of active movements, um, trying to do things on requests, such as lift his arm, uh, for example. And usually the movements increase the more you're trying to put in effort. So he's also got problems you might be able to see in the feet as well, his feet curling. And it affects the face and mouth, tongue as well. So that's that's the kind of classical high-end uh, dystonia. Uh, but not, you know, he still doesn't seem to be, I mean, he doesn't, obviously doesn't seem to like it, but it's not, uh, he's not in pain, it would appear. Uh, I mean, dystonia can be painful as well. And then this is an example of somebody with spasticity. I mean, spasticity is something that you have to feel. Uh, you can't necessarily uh, see it on the camera, but usually what you see is this very brisk reflex. So he's having his knee uh, tendon checked, this individual, and it's very pronounced. So that's how we often check. And often the feet are turned in uh, as well in this situation, but the toes aren't usually curled. So when you get the toe curling, that tends to be more seen with dystonia, whereas this is more typical with spasticity. So usually with dystonia, you don't tend to get such brisk reflexes. And usually there's a lot of stiffness in the ankles as well. So that's just some videos there. I'll go back to the uh, presentation.
Okay, so those, you know, just so that's, I, I tried to show you some of those um, different types of movement names. Uh, as I say, some of them are more feelings uh, when you put, lay the hands on, basically, and gave examples of those um, rigidity, uh, gait apraxia. I say sometimes you can get contractures evolving. So contractures means you can't fully straighten the joint. So around the ankle, uh, for example, or around the knees, that's common. And in fact, scoliosis is a type of contracture. Uh, you could say contracture of the spinal um, joints. Uh, so basically the earliest movement problems can be low muscle tone, uh, but with brisk reflexes. So usually you get brisk reflexes and in other conditions, muscle conditions, you tend to get decreased reflexes with the low muscle tone. And then uh, loss of purposeful uh, hand functions. That's one of the classical features that makes people think about Rett syndrome in the early, year, uh, early couple of years. And then stereotypies developing the hand movements and uh, dyskinesia, which is excessive movements. And I can certainly remember one uh, girl who must be, she's probably in the young adult age group now. So uh, she presented early on with dyskinetic movements, even as an infant. And nobody really thought about Rett syndrome with her. And it was very, this was many years ago. So it would have been going back to the early 2000s or late 90s before the, the gene test was quite, quite, quite widely used. So uh, you had to go by the clinical features for making the diagnosis. So had, it wasn't me who saw her and made the diagnosis. I think a number of colleagues had seen her in the past and nobody particularly thought about a uh, girl having Rett syndrome because she didn't go through the classical uh, stages of Rett syndrome. She just presented from uh, infancy with uh, these excessive movements. Uh, seemed to be a very mobile uh, infant. And uh, she, by the time I saw her, she was just about heading into teenage years and uh, she had a lot of problems with calf contractures. So stiff ankles, you couldn't straighten her ankles anymore um, or we get to the 90 degrees. So she was teetering up on her, her forefeet uh, basically. So toe walking um, and uh, quite difficult to do when you're older and heavier, you're, you're essentially like a ballet dancer um, putting a lot of stress onto the, uh, the balls of your feet. Uh, as well. So uh, that's, it shows you can get an atypical profile. Um, and then uh, I say that that's not very, it's not commonly written about. Uh, it's, there's a number of recent articles that have tried to look at um, the earliest movement problems around stereotypies. And, you know, th this graph shows uh, the most common types of movements tend to be around moving, mouthing movements and hand movements. Uh, as well, clapping, tapping of the movements, finger rubbing uh, as well. And then I say toe walking, uh, which is sometimes seen with stiffness of the ankle, um, uh, inability to, um, to get the ankle to 90 degrees, often associated with unsteadiness, that stiff legged gait, uh, abnormal postures during gait, which is called gait apraxia. And, uh, tremors can evolve as well, uh, usually in the upper limbs. And then the other problems such as spasticity, rigidity, Parkinsonism, uh, and then the secondary musculoskeletal problems such as scoliosis and uh, hip problems tends to be somewhat later. Um, we tend to find either in teenage years or uh, going into adult years. And then you always have to look at the context of other problems uh, that may be present. So uh, I'm sure you'll recognize a lot of these uh, issues. They can come on uh, over time and they don't necessarily cause dystonia, um, but uh, they can either, I think you have to take them into account uh, when you're undertaking treatment, um, partly because some of the medications might uh, worsen some of those other uh, problems such as, you know, uh, some of the movement disorder medications, tone disorder medications affect breathing or potentially affect breathing. Um, so you have to be aware of uh, some of those uh, aspects uh, in girls with Rett syndrome. So, uh, but in other situations, uh, you can get 
an increase in movement disorders uh, with anxiety, for example. So uh, that's quite well recognised in uh, standard dystonia, in other conditions, cerebral palsy, etc., where um, in some individuals it's very in it's enhanced by anxiety, and anxiety is a component feature uh, quite often in uh, girls with rat syndrome. So there can be an interaction uh, with some other uh, comorbidity, as we call them. And then other problems such as constipation, which is quite common, uh, or trapped wind uh, from air swallowing, that can worsen uh, dystonia as well. Uh, so sometimes the treatment may be more directed towards uh, bowel management uh, rather than uh, necessarily a dystonia treatment, a dystonia medication. And then this is from the uh, Rep Syndrome Charities Guideline Development, uh, trying to put together some of these individual problems and how they relate uh, partly to each other. Um, so I've marked in yellow those, uh, those problems that are either very closely related to muscle tone or movement or may interact. So sometimes we've seen reflux, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, um, heartburn, uh, worsening some of the dystonia as well. Uh, we've seen individuals with breath holding attacks. Uh, that can be quite confusing. Sometimes breath holding or hyperventilation can increase tremor uh, as well. Uh, some people believe that tooth grinding uh, may be related to a dyskinetic movement. Others feel it's much more closely related to anxiety. Um, and we do see that in, uh, in individuals who don't have any learning disability as well. So those are some of the uh, conditions or individual problems related to movement, I suppose. And then in terms of treatment, um, there's, as I say, the usual rule of thumb is to identify if there's something else that's set off uh, the movement disorder, whether it's um, constipation, for example, or reflux, uh, and treat those kind those problems. And as I say, also try and work out whether the stiffness or excessive movement is a problem with the joint, for example, you know, that's something that's not amenable to medication. Uh, or whether it's uh, ticks or uh, something that's voluntary, a uh, voluntary movement. Um, because most of these medications that are listed there uh, often cause some side effects if they're not truly needed. Um, there's a typical role, uh, most of the children will have splints or gaiters or uh, some type of postural support. So there may be some adaptation of those uh, that's uh, relevant. Um, you know, whether the splint has become too small or digging in, uh, for example, pressing on the skin, all of those can set off dystonia. Uh, so there, uh, it may be an adaptation to the splint that's required a softer one or some padding, um, for example. So you look at all of those uh, non-medication interventions, but there, there may be a role for medication as well. And the classic medications I've just left uh, up listed there. There's not a huge number of different medications uh, that are used. So uh, baclofen, diazepam, trihexyphenidyl, gabapentin, clonidine, those are the common ones that you may be aware of. And most of them, I mean, they work for spasticity and dystonia. And there's a couple of distinguishing features. So trihexyphenidyl is probably the one that tends to be used for dystonia. Uh, doesn't really tend to work for spasticity. It's got a slightly different mechanism. Um, but in general, the others work on both, uh, which is fortunate. Um, so you don't always have to completely distinguish uh, between them. I mean, some of them are used more for one use than the other. Uh, so baclofen may be used more commonly for spasticity and uh, medication like clondine might be used more often for dystonia. But it's partly habit and practice as much as anything. And usually the, you know, it's the individual side effects of the medication that make people use one drug over another. So diazepam, you know, main side effect is respiratory depression at higher doses or sleepiness. Um, whereas uh, medications such as uh, clonidine may cause less of the respiratory uh, issues, but can also cause problems with sleepiness. Uh, at high doses. So 
you know, that's that's where you get that dif distinction of use uh, rather than because one's necessarily more effective than another. And then uh, Parkinsonism, which we don't tend to see as much in the paediatric sector, but it's certainly uh, recognised in uh, older individuals. Uh, you can use co dopa which is used quite often in Parkinson's disease. Um, and we do use it in children with uh, cerebral palsy and other rare conditions uh, as well. So that's, that's another medication. It's got its own side effects, such as sleepiness or gut dysmotility problems, uh, problems with uh, constipation we've come across as well, or the opposite, loose stool. And then botulinum toxin injections, that has a role uh, as well. So uh, it tends to be used for what we call focal spasticity, meaning one or two limbs generally because it's an injection in the muscle a bit like a it looks like a vaccination you know it's uh, usually it's relatively close to the skin surface maybe half a centimeter below the skin surface the botulinum toxin relieves some of the increased tone and uh, can assist with putting on splints for example um, uh, or with pain uh, as well so it tends to be used where only one or two muscles are affected or more affected um, and then there's other in, uh, conditions such as, uh, sorry, other treatments which are more advanced neurosurgical treatments, uh, which have been used in the setting of Rett syndrome uh, as well, uh, tends to get used more commonly in individuals with cerebral palsy or other genetic uh, conditions. So these are more uh, implantable type of treatments. And then orthopedic surgery may be necessary for fixed musculoskeletal deformities as well. So the, it, you often find that um, some of the medications or even these treatments like deep brain stimulation and trivicobacrofen, they can't necessarily stop uh, musculoskeletal deformities from arising, such as scoliosis. So they may still need um, surgery, spinal surgery or uh, tendon release surgery at some point. And this is just some examples I've found. Uh, so uh, this is somebody with focal foot dystonia, and that's quite a common or relatively common posture that can be found uh, in individuals um, where the foot is turned in. Uh, for example, the toes may be um, bent as well uh, or curled over, basically. So, and often in Rett syndrome, I mean, one of the situations that you get is because of uh, the autonomic, which is the um, sort of the, uh, the nervous system that supplies the blood vessels and skin, uh, you often get this cold peripheries, cold feet uh, sometimes. So uh, that can affect uh, problems like wound healing, for example. So uh, you can get problems around these bony uh, prominences, you know, back of the big toe, uh, you know, the side of the foot, the ankle uh, being very prominent. And you can imagine that pressing against uh, the splint, uh, for example, uh, and you've already got thin skin with uh, problems with blood flow. So that's where uh, you can get some problems uh, and there may be a reason for undertaking, trying to undertake botulinum toxin uh, injection. So you don't need surgery, you don't need necessarily any general anesthetic um, or even any sedation. Uh, and that's just a picture showing an example of uh, what people do with um, botulinum toxin injection, uh, often done with an ultrasound to find the muscle, or sometimes people use a st nerve stimulator to find the overactive muscle. And then the injection is sometimes very similar to a, a vaccine, basically. So sometimes it's not that far below the skin. Uh, some of these muscles may be a bit further down, so three centimetres um, for, uh, underneath the skin. And the botulinum toxin injection, when it works well, uh, it can work very well, uh, particularly if uh, it doesn't tend to work so well when uh, there's a fixed contracture, we can't move the joint because the bone uh, and the joints have formed that way over years. Whereas if it's something relatively early in the process, uh, definitely where, you know, at certain times the, the ankles turned in, but other times the ankles less turned in, you know, more stimulated by sensations, then uh, the botulinum toxin works quite well in that situation. So uh, we've tried that recently in someone, we'll see 
how effective it is uh, to try and avoid surgery as long as possible. And then this is just some pictures uh, just to give an idea of what deep brain stimulation and intrathecal baclofen are. So intrathecal baclofen is essentially like oral baclofen uh, that's taken through the mouth of the gastrostomy, but it's delivered straight into the spinal fluid. Um, so it has to be delivered through a pump uh, device. So there's an, it has to be implanted under the skin. And you have to be big enough usually to have that. It's a reasonable size, uh, the pump. Uh, so you need a, a space underneath the rib cage and the pelvic rim you know, in that area demonstrated in the picture. Uh, and you need a good amount of skin cover as well. So it's not ideal uh, or very good for somebody with thin skin who's underweight, uh, particularly because uh, it tends to cause, it, it tends to stretch the skin too much. Uh, whereas if there's a lot of skin and weight, then that, that shouldn't be a problem. And that's used very much, it's used typically for spasticity, uh, more in the legs, but it is used for dystonia as well. Um, so it's often used where there's very significant problems in all four limbs. Um, so that's commonly used, uh, you know, probably the most common use is in children with cerebral palsy. And then deep brain stimulation is another treatment. It's uh, not done as frequently, but uh, we haven't done any uh, for individuals with Rett syndrome, but certainly it has been uh, undertaken in uh, some uh, children with Rett syndrome. So that's used uh, for dystonia. So it doesn't really work for spasticity. Um, and in essence, it's like a pacemaker, uh, which goes under the uh, collarbone, but instead of going to the heart, like a uh, pacemaker for the heart, it goes to the brain. Uh, so it runs up the side of the neck under the skin, goes to the top of the head, and then there's electrodes that are uh, placed into the uh, deep part of the brain. So, you know, it requires neurosurgical planning. Uh, it's... You know, it's not without its risks, but it's not felt to be, you know, certainly with modern uh, techniques, it's not felt to be the risk it was uh, you know, 20 years ago. So the um, girls have to have an MRI scan of the brain to identify where to place the, the electrodes uh, into the deep brain and avoid blood vessels because that's the main side effect is uh, damaging a blood vessel and causing, in essence, a stroke. So causing more problems uh, than you were treating. And fortunately, that's uncommon. Uh, and, and I'd probably put it in the rare group now. Uh, the kind of figures people give out is 0.3% in the adult sector. So the main problem tends to be infection and with both of them. They're implantable devices. So uh, that tends to uh, attract infection. Um, but it, that said, um, the majority do not have any problems um, with that, that type of issue. And the main problem tends to be lack of effect, if anything. And I suppose it's like with all medications, there's uh, a certain proportion of individuals seems to get very good benefit. And then you get other individuals who seem to get no benefit. And you can't always predict ahead of time who's going to get the benefit and who doesn't. Uh, so obviously, with these invasive treatments, you feel like you ought to have tried other medications first and the problems need to be significant enough to go down this path. So now that was, I think that's what I had to say about movement and tone disorders uh, in Rett syndrome. Now specifically, I think, uh, you know, people were asking or um, yourselves were asking about what's happened during COVID um, because of, uh, you know, the lockdown and uh, restriction of services uh, to a large degree. And um, what's happened to uh, girls with Rett syndrome in terms of their symptoms and so on. And I suppose, I mean, I'll, I'll probably hear from yourself as much as me telling you. I mean, uh, I mean, the big issue has been, um, you know, I mean, just, just as a simple example with these uh, treatments such as neurosurgical treatments, spasticity and dystonia treatments, and you know even the botulinum toxin injections generally that's gone down you know i mean there's been uh, a big waiting list because uh, these require surgical lists which were removed in essence or cancelled and probably there's a backlog uh, 
uh, I think that's probably the best way to put it, uh, of uh, these treatments where they were already planned uh, before March 2020. So uh, there's certainly individuals who are still waiting uh, from before March 2020 um, for the whole process, because it's not just surgery, there's usually some other level of assessment, physiotherapy assessments, and uh, they've been a bit thin on the ground uh, as well. Uh, so similarly, you know, with botulinum toxin injection, uh, there's probably a waiting list and uh, only certain in, certain conditions have been um, uh, prioritised. You know, if there's active pain issues, whereas if it's doing it to see will it work, I think that's taken a lower priority uh, compared to someone who's had it regularly and it's whenever it wears off because it, it works for about three, four months before it starts wearing off and some of the problems start coming back. So if they've been on long-term treatment if, uh, with relapse as the toxin wears off, uh, they've generally been the priority. And then there'll be other issues which you'll probably be able to speak about more yourself about uh, access to orthotics or uh, community therapies uh, as well. So, you know, I think, you know, I, th I suspect it's still going to be an issue for at least the next year in terms of catching up with previous, uh, previously treated individuals, let alone anyone who's coming into the system now. And that, that seems to be generally the case across the country, um, rather than specifically just us uh, here. Uh, but certainly it is an issue. Um, so I can wait to hear from yourself, uh, any individual um, experiences. Well, thank you, um, Ram. That's been really interesting. And we have quite a few questions, actually. So I'm going to hand over to Beth now, who's going to put the questions to you. I will. Thank you so much, uh, Ram. That was, um, as someone who is not very good at distinguishing between the various movements of my daughter, and when I'm faced with um, things like the CPMRS questionnaires, asked about how often, you know, how many times a week does she have dystonia or spasticity or rigidness or um, that was very helpful in kind of making those distinctions clear. Uh, we do have quite a lot of questions. I'm just going to go through them and read them out. Um, if anyone who asked the question, um, put the question in the chat, uh, wants to jump in and rephrase or add anything, please feel free to unmute and do so. So I'm going to work our way backwards. Um, first question. Can dystonia of the tongue or face lead to a deterioration of the swallow and cause problems with secretions or increased rates of aspiration? Or is this more likely to be related to seizures? Yeah, I mean, um, so the movements of the tongue, uh, that's a bit difficult. It's, I think it seems to be part of, uh, I mean, it's been described in uh, Rett syndrome specifically, I think, uh, over time. So people did video fluoroscopy, uh, for example. Uh, I'm sure that was like years ago. I can remember it was, it feels like it was about 20 years ago uh, where they did video fluoroscopy serially in individuals with um, the uh, with Rett syndrome, showing some deterioration uh, occurring in the control of uh, those tongue movements, uh, the complexity of tongue movements. I mean, you could argue, you know, the movements around the tongue are the, probably the most complex, you know, all of the movements around the jaw and uh, lips and tongue are the most complicated movements. There's, you know, uh, it's probably got the highest concentration of muscles actually uh, around the face. And the coordination of tongue movements is extremely complex as well. So it feels like it's more an apraxia almost. Uh, so apraxia, I, th I think I mentioned before, is this kind of difficulty with coordination. Usually people use it to mean use of tools. So it's not quite the use of a tool, but or use or learned skills. So a learned skill with tongue would be whistling, for example. You know, you don't you sometimes learn how to whistle uh, by learning how to move your tongue movements. I can't whistle. Uh, I've never learned it, you know, so, um, you know, I can't construct my tongue muscles into the right shape to get a loud whistle, whereas other people can. Uh, so it's, so in 
uh, Rett syndrome, I think the tongue movements are a type of probably the closest thing is like an apraxia, a bit like the problems with walking, you know, with that stiff legged walking. And you can get a deterioration in that, um, those tongue movements. And uh, it's, so that's why you can get uh, problems with swallowing and drooling developing uh, over time. Uh, often, you know, so you'll find in infants, for example, usual infants, they have a back and forth kind of suck, but they don't necessarily know how to, they don't usually know how to move their tongue side to side. And then they learn how to do that as they get older. So it's, there's a kind of maturation process that usually happens with learning how to control your tongue for even something that seems simple, uh, such as swallowing. Now you can get dystonia in the tongue as well. So, uh, you know, you can certainly see, you know, that in, I mean, once again, we go back to the most classical condition, which is cerebral palsy. You can certainly see abnormal tongue movements uh, with dystonia developing, and you can get dystonia in the um, vocal cords as well. Uh, so you can get kind of in coordination between breathing uh, and swallowing uh, as well. So the reason I mention it is it doesn't necessarily respond to anti-dystonia medications, you know, those tongue movements. So sometimes, you know, if you try and treat it as dystonia and you put them on baclofen or clonidine, it doesn't necessarily uh, reverse the issue. And sometimes it just makes you floppier in the, you know, the windpipe, basically, the food pipe, without necessarily improving things. So slightly circular way of mentioning it, but I suppose it's, once again, it's trying to look at these problems and work out, is it actually dystonia or dystonia that will respond to the treatments we've got, I suppose. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Beth, can I just ask a question off the back of that? Yeah, of course. Um, I suppose um, what I'm wondering is if, you know, you said it's a deterioration, this, this is something that's happening in a six-year-old child and then the child is aspirating a lot and ending up with lots of chest infections and being seriously ill. And if you were sort of, I know it's hard, you can't advise people when you're not seeing them, but what about considering something to control this, all these additional secretions like um, Botox in the jaw, yeah. something like that? Would Is that something you would consider? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, obviously, you, you try those simple uh, things like uh, some individuals might be on glycoperonium, uh, which is anti secretion medication, others are on hyacine patch. That's generally what tends to be advised by the ENT people. I mean, here uh, in Liverpool, it's the uh, ENT uh, consultants, uh, one of them who does the Botox injections. Uh, it might be someone else, another specialty. I used to do it, but I thought well, actually there's an ENT person here who can do it, so why not let them do it? And uh, so, yeah, so Botox, botulinum toxin injection to the salivary glands, uh, can certainly help with sort of oral drooling. Um, you know, it can sometimes make the uh, saliva too thick. You know, so I've certainly come across that before. It seems to sort of change the composition of the salivary fluid. So I've certainly come across a couple of individuals where they got it got too thick, basically. Um, so uh, in essence, just reduce the frequency of you doing salivary injections and then uh, the other is uh, some I can't remember anyone with Rett syndrome having salivary gland uh, duct removal or salivary duct uh, ligation or a gland removal but you can do that as well so sometimes they remove the smaller salivary glands under the tongue uh, under the chin um, uh, which can reduce secretion as well that's very helpful thank you Thank you. Um, hopefully a, a shorter one. Um, can feet turn outwards with focal foot dystonia? So only inwards? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it probably turns out more, I suspect. I mean, um, so yeah, so you get different types of foot postures. So the classic turning in of the foot, that's, um, that's no, you tend to see that with overactivity of a particular muscle. That's, it's quite deep. Uh, in the within the calf, basically. So uh, that's a kind of a classic posture. 
uh, and out turning of the foot tends to be the opposite muscles uh, basically so they're slightly more towards the surface um, on the opposite side of the uh, of the leg and I'd say that's probably more common in some ways I think yeah okay thank you that's clear um who would you recommend for adults re-movement disorders in the northwest or indeed anywhere in the, in the country who who should we be going to for for adults with movement disorders rather than pediatrics yeah yeah so uh i mean certainly i mean it depends on i mean i know uh, i mean at manchester uh, i mean which is salford and at uh, walton center uh, in liverpool uh, they'll have movement disorder specialists uh, there uh, not so sure about preston because that's another neuro neurological uh, center as well, neurosurgical center. Certainly, uh, treatments such as uh, if it's a problem with Parkinsonism, uh, which you often see, or spasticity, or uh, condition treatments like uh, if needed, intrathecal baclofen um, and deep brain stimulation. They're done at Salford and um, at uh, the Walton Center. Uh, I don't think Preston do. Intr sorry, uh, deep brain stimulation. I think they do do intrathecal baclofen. Um, so, yeah, th those would be the places. I mean, I know the Walton Centre better because uh, they're closer. I mean, I was just just before this meeting, I was. Uh, we usually do a kind of a, a teams meeting uh, in between, basically. Um, so I was just in the meeting uh, there. So some of the transitional patients when they've gone from paediatrics to the adult sector will go through that if if we've done things like intrathecal baclofen or deep brain stimulation okay that's great i'm sure that's very helpful to some people here to know where to go and who to look for um a question from christine how do you distinguish between a focal seizure and dystonia um, it can appear quite similar and our neuro has always struggled to determine what it is yeah yeah, I mean, it can be. I mean, you know, uh, I don't think the movements I showed you look like a seizure, uh, but there are individuals who tend to have, you know, it tends to be things that come on suddenly. So startles, you know, so you can get uh, dystonic startles, uh, basically, or you can get epileptic startles. So startling tends to be the movements that uh, cause uh, most confusion sometimes um, and you can get startles where you go into a posture as well so uh, often with you know head turning to one side for example so that can uh, sometimes cause that uh, confusion uh, what else uh, tends to look quite similar so yeah I mean it, it, I've seen I've tend to find it startles because uh, some startles tend to happen as you're going off to sleep uh, for example, uh, I suppose there's, there's also com what people think of as complex partial seizures. So uh, not not necessarily with dystonia, but uh, vacant staring. That tends to be the the thing that tends to cause confusion, particularly if there's a posture uh, associated with it as well. If you go into a habitual posture uh, whilst you're doing your vacant staring, sometimes you can get problems from over breathing. Uh, as well, uh, which once again can be associated with things like uprolling of the eyes, uh, for example. So, uprolling of the eyes, you can see with certain types of dystonia, ocular gyric crises, they're called. Uh, that's the, the term for it, but in essence, it just means the eyes turn up. You can get that in certain conditions, dystonic conditions, and it looks rather like it can be difficult to distinguish from a absence seizure, where you can sometimes also get abnormalities occurring around the face and eye movements um Ralph, I mean, can, I just, sorry, can i just ask then how 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 would we determine that then because at the moment um it, the, the biggest kind of feature that we're seeing is a kind of a turn a turn to the left where a kind of our, our neck muscles kind of stiffen um and and you know she can become quite stiff and her arms stiffen and we've never ever been treated for dystonia it's always been thought of as a focal seizure but they've they've yeah. always found it very very difficult to determine and i suppose i'm just worried in case we are missing something because i know that dystonia can be quite painful so how do i try and encourage the neuro to kind of what what features do i need to, to look at to try and kind of help them with determining you know is it a seizure or is it um dystonia yeah i mean usually you end up saying you know what happened just before um you know what were they doing just before the event um 
was there any kind of build up or warning? Um, you know, I mean, you can get uh, usually with um, with focal seizures, you can sometimes get an aura, uh, as they call it, where they might look a bit panicked. Um, for example, the heart rate increases or the pupils usually dilate uh, during a seizure. You don't tend to get seizures. This is the kind of nothing's true 100 percent of the time, but uh, in seizures, classically, your eyes are open uh, rather than closed. You can always find somebody where it was closed, actually. Uh, but typically, the eyes open wide and the pupils dilate. Um, and usually, the pupils don't respond to light when you're having a seizure as well. So they tend to be fixed, um, at least during the time. And the seizure can be so short, you obviously haven't got time to do all of those things, such as see if they're reacting to light. Uh, usually, the heart rate increases. Uh, with a seizure. Now it can go up with dystonia as well, but it tends to, sometimes it can be increased before the, they do any movements, uh, basically. And, you know, desaturation, that's quite common, but I mean, obviously with Rett syndrome, confusion thing is you can get that uh, even without a seizure, uh, basically due to breath holding uh, cyanotic attacks uh, as well. So, so usually, and then you want to know what happens after the event, you know, do they have what they call a postictal period, uh, which is where you're out of it um, and you're drowsy. But unfortunately, you can, in that syndrome, you can get that if you've been hypoxic, uh, breath holding uh, for a period as well. So it is, it's genuinely confusing uh, in this situation. You sometimes have to do a, a video telemetry um, and that might be the only way you know, or the closest way of determining, which is basically a recording where the EEG is on, there's a video uh, that may be linked up to a heart rate monitor as well, usually you may have an oxygen saturation probe uh, as well. And, uh, you know, the, so that set of things has to be done and you have to have an attack during the, you know, the, the video uh, as well and the EEG capture. And it might, you might have to do that. And certainly, you know, there's individuals that's done in hospital, uh, maybe done in, um, uh, there's home versions as well. Uh, so they've got versions where they attach it in the hospital and send you home with it. Uh, does 48 hours of recording, uh, for example. So we've certainly done that uh, before to be able to distinguish. Um, yeah, so it, it is genuinely difficult and usually you know, people used to over, I mean, generally you find people over treat for seizures. That's typically what you find. I mean, you do get under treatment, but generally these days you tend to say that over treatment tends to be more common um, for things that people thought were seizures, but turn out not to be. I mean, I, I came across one, somebody just yesterday who was on three medications and he thought, you know, that's, it's not common that you're on three medications, but you are, you do get it. Um, but uh, if, medications aren't working you certainly think for anticonvulsants if they're not working you, you think oh, is it actually a seizure and it turned out not to be a seizure in the end um, because the EEG can look abnormal and seizure like in girls with rat syndrome but you have to try and link it together at the same time they're having the event so you can't just use a stack of one-off EEG it needs to be capturing the episode at the same time that's really helpful thank you for that Thanks. Um, we have got a few more questions, Dr. Kumar. Are you, but I am aware that we are a bit over time. Are you okay to stay on for a few minutes or would you prefer yeah. me to email these questions? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I could I probably got, I've got to get, I'm actually on call. Uh, I've got to get to another uh, meeting uh, soon. I mean, I could, I mean, I could do an, I mean, I could certainly send me the questions and I can answer that. I mean, if you want to, we can answer another question. Yeah. If you've got time for, for, yeah. A couple of quick ones. I know Natalia's on the call. Natalia, it might be easier if you just explain what you're, if you can unmute and then just um, pose your question. Yeah, hello, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, my daughter is still very young, so she's growing a lot. And, you know, this time last year, she was starting to make steps herself. And then during summer, she had all sorts of sort of like jerking or like sort of dropping knees movements. Mm -hmm. 
and she had it for a few months and seemed to have gotten better. At the moment, again, we literally have one day she seems okay, standing can, you know, support herself, bear weight, holding on to something. And the next day she will be jerking again. Yesterday she was just sitting and started sort of almost like jerking backwards. So, so her legs are almost like kicking out. We, and it's just because she's so young and growing so much, it's just so difficult. We don't know where, I don't know whether to start trying to get an appointment, do I worry about it, or do you wait and see, or just as Christine mentioned, I don't want to be missing out on something, but then I don't want to be over panicking, knowing that she's so young and growing mm. still. Um, so what what is your, so what would you suggest um, yeah. is best way of action? You know, what is it I need to worry about, or know that this is worrying, I should be contacting a doctor, and other yeah. things it is as we know lots of um movement disorders in in red and is not so dangerous if you like and you don't just wait and see what happens yeah i mean yeah i mean usually i say i mean with uh i mean if you think of most um i mean what people worried about most would be seizures uh true seizures as i put it you know with okay. uh, tonic clonic seizures as the term goes where you've got sort of shaking that goes on for <clears throat> usually more than uh, 15 minutes um, you know sort of uh, with uh, problems with breathing as a result of the um, the seizure so that tends to be the the type of seizure people are worried about now if it's not that then uh, that type of seizure uh, and usually you you know it takes you uh, you know hours sometimes to come around from that if it's not that then you've got time to wait i suppose i mean some people get worried that if their seizures that it'll get worse if you leave it untreated but actually you know we don't really think that anymore um so that's what used to lead to people getting over treated um so usually if it's not a clear tonic clonic seizure as we call them uh then you've got some time to wait to see what they are basically um, and certainly, you know, the, the, we get that type of situation that you, you're mentioning there with, uh, you know, you don't know how, exactly how to describe the seizures. I mean, you know, we use terms like myoclonic movements, startles, um, you know, those, uh, you know. Yeah, this is what uh, Dr. Lanson thought she may have with this knees dropping. She, he, yeah. uh, he said it might be myoclonus. Yeah. But it has to be done with 48 hours telemetry that we're waiting for. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, my clonic. So that's a. I mean, I, I didn't use that term, uh, but it's it's one of those classic movements which sometimes you uh, it's epileptic myoclonus and sometimes it's non-epileptic myoclonus. So that's a classic. It's it startle is you know um, another term. It comes under myoclonus. Um, so uh, yeah. So th there you're trying to work out why. Uh, you know, I mean, I can remember somebody, for example, you know, and this wasn't somebody with Rett syndrome, somebody with Angerman syndrome, which is a different condition, but there's certain similarities. And we went completely round the house, you know, started off by saying it was non-epileptic. Then we said it was epileptic and we decided it was non-epileptic. And then we finally we decided it was epileptic after all, you know, so, uh, you know, and because we tried all of the anticonvulsants initially and it didn't seem to work. Uh, or, you know, the, the standard ones. And then we tried some treatments that you use for non-epileptic dystonia, and that didn't seem to work. So eventually we, you know, after about several years, came back to the medication that might have started off with, uh, but called it epileptic myoclonus. Um, so, you know, it, it shows it, and that, that took years, basically, to, uh, to work out what was going on. Um, even with an EEG, and that's with somebody who had an EEG on at the same time as these yeah. events. So it's uh, because if you've got background problems on the EEG, which you get with Rett syndrome individuals, and you can get that with Angelman as well, you know, sometimes by chance, you know, movements occur at the same time as something was going on in the EEG, but they weren't truly linked uh, together. So, so yeah, so certainly it's, you know, it sounds like it's my clonus and the myoclonus, you know, uh, you often end up using sometimes medications, 
if it's she's on that. Kepra. She's been on Kepra since diagnosis was two and a half years. But it's nothing, something that I need to worry immediately about. No. Or, but yeah. just it needs investigating and yeah. hopefully figuring out. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, um, thank you. And and Ram, you can tell from all the questions that we've had, this is obviously an area of great need that lots of people are interested in. And there's so yeah. many overlapping issues, as you explained. It, it's yeah. been really helpful and insightful um, to sort of hear more of the context of, of all the different movement problems in Rett syndrome. And we really appreciate you taking time to answer questions. As Beth said, um, there are a few more. So if you don't mind, we'll yeah, pop that's fine. And I, I, should, I should also mention, you know, like my colleague, Dr. Lumsden, you know, so before this meeting, I said, help, can you just tell me what to say? So I said, I'll just tell you, I'll tell everyone what you've said. Okay, so it's him, <laughs> he's the guy, you know, uh, so, uh, so you can trust his judgment as well. So yeah, of course, and I think it's really helpful to have lots of different messages about health reinforced from lots of different people yeah. uh, and through different um, avenues. And there's so much confusion. It doesn't hurt to to hear things in lots of different ways. And um, yeah. it so for everybody, uh, after today's session, we'll send out a quick survey. Please take a minute to complete it because it really helps us plan future sessions. And if you enjoyed today's session, there is another bite-sized session on the 23rd of April, and that's Dr. Chisti Samya. Um, and Tilly Mastrani from uh, talking about the common health issues that they see at the centre uh, at King's. So the link with the details and the booking info will be sent to you by Beth and also posted in the chat, I think. Next week, we're holding an online family forum uh, on Wednesday night at eight o'clock where people can talk more openly. And I think it's probably discuss some of the things that we've talked about today that's a good place to do that so once again thank you everyone for being here and thank you to dr kumar for taking the time to be with us um see okay. you all. Yeah. all right thank okay you. bye thank you bye. have a good thank weekend okay bye jackie bye. if you're still listening um i know you've